Erica Zhang helped spur the sexual revolution with her 1973 bestseller, Fear of Flying. Its unabashed view of female sexual desire and fantasy brought her fame and fortune and helped many women explore their own sexuality. She's since written five other best-selling novels and published six winning books of poetry. Now she's moved from fiction to fact, chronicling the real story behind her books in a memoir called Fear of Fifty, and we're pleased to have her here. Welcome. Hello. Hi, How are you? <laughs> it's great to have you. Uh, are, are you scared of 50? I'm not scared of 50 and at all. You're 52, actually, right? I'm 52. Yeah. Actually, the title Fear of 50 is something of a tongue in cheek title. Yeah. And maybe a to bit play of off a, of Fear of Flying? Yeah, and maybe a bit of a misnomer because really, Fear of 50 is the story of the last 50 years in the lives of women told through the perspective of my life yeah. as a typical member of what I call the whiplash generation. What do you want to say to, I mean, what are you symbolic of? I mean, you, you talk about, well, go ahead, you tell me. I think that what I want to say in Fear of 50 is that we've lived through 50 years of unprecedented changes in women's lives and men's lives. And we have been sort of snapping our heads from side to side like spectators at a tennis game, yeah. hence the term whiplash. And this is as true for men as it is for women. Men who have read Fear of 50 have said, but our lives have changed constantly too. I mean, we grew up in the era when women were supposed to be Doris Day and men were supposed to be Beaver Cleaver. When we came into our 20s, it was suddenly the sexual revolution, right. which was whatever that means. You know, we can debate what it means. And then we had a decade of backlash and role changes again in which reproductive freedom was threatened, in which suddenly sex meant death because we had a huge AIDS epidemic. And we find ourselves raising our children in the age of Madonna mm. or Princess Di. And so, really, we've had unprecedented changes in the roles of the sexes. And I thought that I could chronicle this humorously through, your own through life. my own life. Yeah. And that's really the point of fear. Much of what you do is about your own life. Much of your writing, isn't it? I think much of what any writer does is about his or her own life. I mean, I can't imagine that Melville would have written a book about someone who went whaling if he had never been on a whaling ship. Yeah. I think that... You have to write about what you know, and what you know best is your own life, and what you have most unique about your own experience is your own life. I think you, you know it most deeply, and you feel most passionately about those changes through it. I mean, Fear of 50 started out to be a more theoretical book. Yeah. I was doing all kinds of research about statistics and right. the lives of women. I made the decision to cut all that stuff out of the book. I, I always am fascinated by introduction. You make, this is for my daughter Molly, your turn now. She's, what, 15, 16 now? Yeah. She'll be 16 you, this You summer. start the book in which it's 1992, right? Yes. And you are walking, I mean, you're, you're in Venice? No, or, we're in, at, in, in, Molly and I are at a spa. Right, right. And we're doing exercise. We're, yeah. we're at Canyon Ranch in the Berkshires. Oh, right, okay. But actually, I start the book with my, my father's advice oh. to me. Which is? Never follow a dog act. <laughs> and I never understood what he meant. Yeah. But my father came out of vaudeville. One of the great stories that I got out of Fear of 50 from interviewing my parents was I came to see my parents as human beings and understand their lives in a way I never did before. My father always used to say, never follow a dog act. Yeah. And I never knew what he meant. What did he and mean? what he meant was that you can't follow. He was, he, his frame of reference was vaudeville. He was a musician. Right. And he, he was a drummer. He had his own band. He worked in little boats during the yeah. Depression. And what he meant was, you can't compete with dogs and little kids. Right. You want to be the, he what he really meant was, always be the headliner on the bill. And it took me my whole life to figure out where that came from. And that in a sense, he had put all his vaudeville ambitions into me. Yeah. A very confusing thing for a writer, basically. <laughs> so I came to understand that. And, and also... And, and you, both your mother and your father did that, in, didn't they? Didn't in they? a different way. Yeah, my mother they, is a painter, right. and a wonderful painter. I mean, they thought you were their little genius. And yes, and, and they then were. And when you wrote uh, uh, *Fear of Flying*, they thought it had been confirmed. Their little daughter had gone to Columbia and written a master's thesis on Alexander Pope, and all of a sudden she has both commerce and literature because she writes this bestseller. They said, "My goodness." They weren't she's, entirely she's conquered, happy. <laughs> she's conquered commerce and and academia. That's that's probably true. But what I discovered writing *Fear of Fifty* that was very interesting to me was that my mother gave me a very special gift and that was the gift of believing in the imagination. Yeah. When I told my mother I was writing an autobiography, she would bring me little post-it notes with things to jog my memory. And on one of the post-it notes, she had, 
Dee Dee, Funnel Like, and the famous guy. Yeah. And I said, who were they? And she said, these were your imaginary friends when you were little, and you used to have long conversations with them. And there is probably one of the best things in the book is my memories, fantasies, about these imaginary friends. And after I wrote that well, chapter... Well, it's, it's the best part of the book because it... what? Because it delves into the way fantasy creates one's life, the way your imagination when you're a child creates what you become. And what I discovered about my mother was that she was someone who valued fantasy and who wanted a child, really, basically, to live the life of the imagination. She never mocked it. She thought it was special. I didn't know that before I wrote Fear of Fifty. I knew all the bad things about my parents that I had railed against. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what made them unique as people. I also don't think I understood very well their growing up during the Depression, the world in which they got married, I asked my father, why did you get married that year? And he said, well, because the Volstead Act was being repealed. Yes. And I thought there'd be work in the clubs. I would recommend that everybody write an autobiography in order to find out about who they are and how they came to be who they are. All right, let me, or let me stay with that. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the, some of the things you have said, not just in the book, but, but you have said in interviews and profiles, which is one where you talked about ambition, and you said that your ambition was so high that no matter what you did, a little bit of you always felt like a failure. That's still true, actually. What, why do you have that guilt? I don't know. Or whatever know. it is. I mean, why can't you say, my goodness, I'm at 52 years old, and I've written all these books, and I've got, I'm now in a fourth marriage, but this one works, and I've got this wonderful daughter, and my goodness, life has been great for me. Tell Dr. Rose what your problem is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I was filled with so much yeah. ambition yeah. as a kid that no matter what I did, I always felt that I was a failure. But is that still true at 50? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in 50 how you are and what you have to say to us in terms of reaching 50. Actually, the truth is that I feel very serene about my life at yeah. this point. And I don't anxious, any longer feel like a failure. And there's nobody I'm afraid of meeting. And I have a kind of center and serenity in my life. And I think you feel that when you read Fear of 50. I'm looking back on the crazy times, the wild love affairs, yeah. the near self-destruct of early fame, which is very, very hard to deal with, the, um, the things that made me who I am. The near self-destruct of earlier fame. You, you almost self-destruct. When you get world famous at 31, yeah. and for a first book, right. and all the parasites come at you with temptations of one sort or another. Like what? Oh, temptations to come to Hollywood and write movies for right. lots of money, when really what you want to do is write poems and novels. Temptations to sell out and do commercials for female hygiene right. products, uh, or even word processors. All those things that suddenly come at you and are very confusing. Generally, people don't survive the fame of a book that sells 12 and a half million copies. How did I survive it? I survived it because I went back to Connecticut and I started writing poetry again. And I never quite took that fame seriously. But you did come to the realization that for the rest of your life, people would be talking about the zipless zoom because yeah. you had coined that phrase and it was sort of the essential notion of fear of flying. And you had to come to the notion about that, that, that you have to live with that. In the same way that Carole King is going to have to sing certain songs for the rest of her life. That's because people are going to insist true. on those songs identified with her. And the same thing about James Taylor and the same thing about so many other artists. But we don't, get, we don't get to choose our sound bite. And we don't get to choose what we get famous for. That's so in that lap of the... So Zipless is your soundbite. It's my soundbite, and yeah. I've got it. But do I believe it? No, yeah. I don't believe it. I but believe that I should go on developing as a writer, yeah. that I should try new challenges, that I should continue to write poetry and journalism and novels and nonfiction. And so what fame was for me, I think, the, was the great test of character. Why? Because if you are given all these chances to sell out and you discover that what you really have to do is to go back and write another book, right. then you discover what's important to you. And of course, when you've had that kind of fame, people are not kind when you write the next book. They're very well, tough on you. Well, let me speak Everything to is in a fishbowl, right? Let me speak to that. Mm -hmm. uh, Fear of Flying, nothing you have done since then has been as successful as mm -hmm. Fear of Flying. Right. Uh, is your life, in a sense, driven by the notion of somehow you got to find another fear of flying, or you have come to peace with that and view that as sort of something that happened to you when you were 31, and you can get on with other things and not have to be 
uh, forever driven by the notion of got to show that I can do it again. I'm not driven by that notion. I mean, no book sells 12 and a half million copies if it's only In read 27 languages. Right, if it's only read by people who read books. A book only does that when it strikes a certain chord in the culture. So I accept that and I go on. I accept that maybe no other book of mine will ever sell 12 and a half million copies. So what? It would be truly tragic if I let that early blip on the screen keep me from developing as a writer. Fear of 50 is a much more interesting book, much more mature right. book. It's better written. It's a very different book. Yeah. And it is, it's really written by somebody who's come to terms with herself, who is at peace with herself. I hope it's extremely empowering to the people who read it because it's inspiring in that way. Yeah. Tell me about the, what it says about our addictions to work and to things like to that. To fame. To fame and to alcohol and to a lot of other we things. Are, we are much too much um, dependent on what other people think of us yeah. and too little dependent on what we think of ourselves. And all happiness in life comes from doing the things that you yourself respect whether other people notice them or not. There's a certain perfectionism that I have in my writing. I rewrite everything hundreds of times until I get... Hundreds of times? Yeah, hundreds of times until I get so it right. So you leave nothing for the editor, huh? Well, I, I listen to my editors, yeah. too, in England and in America, and I listen and I, I take notes and I care what they say. But what I get out of my own work are the craftsman's intimate satisfactions, as John Updike once said. Maybe other people don't notice that. I notice it. So I finally feed myself every day through what I think of my own work. When it comes out into the world, I can't control the response. John Updike, in a sense, discovered you. I mean, that piece he wrote, that review in The New Yorker, in the New Yorker. sent fear of flying sky high. Didn't right. it? Not? It was sort of undiscovered until after that. You say also that your daughter, Molly, you like her a lot better than you like yourself. I mean, is that because you think you've been a sensational mother or you see things that... Sh that about her, you say, I wish I was like that, but I'm not, and I understand who I am and understand who she is, and so that's the One, difference between us. I have been a sensational mother, right. and I've given her, I hope I've empowered Molly. But the other thing that I like about her is that she's very outspoken, and she speaks her mind, and it took me a long time to do that. She doesn't flatter, and she doesn't flirt, and she says exactly what she thinks. And how old was she when she read Fear Flying? She started to read it when she was 13 and put it down after 50 pages, and she said, Mom, I don't want to know this. At the beginning of Fear of 50, I, I relate a voyage with Molly in yeah. which I give her Fear of Flying to read, yeah. and she reads a few pages, and she says, Mom, I don't want to know about this. I want you to be Mom, not a writer, and I think that's, that's very healthy. You say that here that, I mean, Chapter 6 is about sex, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, and it, and it uh, and, uh, tell me your fantasy. He says, tell me, he reaches down, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's less sex in this book than, than in previous books. And you say everything you have to say about sex is in chapter six. That's right. What's in chapter six for the, those of us who haven't read chapter six? I talk about the paradox that sometimes we have the most passionate sex with somebody that we're not even suited for. That sometimes the person we cannot have a relationship with is the person with whom the sex is absolutely the hottest. And sometimes you go to bed with the person that is your best friend in the world and you're almost too close to make love. You're up talking all night. This doesn't always happen, but there is a paradox that when you love somebody tremendously, you don't want to be absorbed into that person and sometimes you back away from sex. This is something we haven't considered. Sometimes it's normal to have fantasies about other people even though you live with somebody who is your closest friend. And I deal with the permutations and combinations of that in chapter six, I really deal with this, the fantasies that we have about sex, the dreams that we have about sex. How can we make them a reality or not? And I expose my own sexual fantasies really as a way of coming to terms with the way people feel about their sexuality and the paradoxes of being human. Well, I can hear those little feet going to the bookstores already. Erica Zhang, a midlife memoir, Fear of 50. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Charlie. Great to see you. Great to see you. We'll be right back. Carol King is here. Back in a moment. Stay with us.